Hey, it's Ryan, and today I'm out here on Big Stone doing a little bit of early ice scouting for what makes Big Stone so famous, and that's its numbers of perch and its really big bluegills. For those of you who are not familiar with Big Stone, I'll give you a little bit of a rundown on the last decade or so on the lake. You know, many years ago, in the 90s especially, Big Stone was known as a walleye fishery, a walleye factory. Big Stone at one point had more walleyes per acre than any other lake in Minnesota. But things really began to change somewhere in the last 10 to 15 years. And Big Stone really started to see some big booms in its perch population. And a lot of that can be attributed to the introduction of curly leaf pondweed. Curly leaf pondweed in Big Stone grows anywhere from about maybe three foot of water all the way out to the depths of the basin. And for those of you who are not familiar with curly leaf pondweed, curly leaf pondweed begins its life cycle growing in the fall. It grows through the winter under the ice. Some years it grows very quickly when there's no snow. Some years it's very slow growing when there's a lot of snow. But once the ice goes off the lake, the curly leaf shoots up like a rocket, and then sometime in late June, early July, it dies off and the wind blows it off the lake and the basin opens back up again. So throughout the lake in Big Stone, you can find this curly leaf pondweed all over the place. And it's really made for some incredible perch fishing. And in more recent years, it's really seemed to help grow a bumper crop of really big bluegills, a lot of fish in that 10 and even sometimes the 11 inch range. For all the fantastic perch fishing and all the trophy bluegills that Big Stone now has, Big Stone can sometimes still be a challenge when it comes to breaking it down and finding and consistently catching fish. But there's ways of breaking it down and there's ways of making Big Stone much more manageable. There's a few techniques that work best at certain times of the year. There's a few areas of the lake that tend to hold more fish than others. And there's definitely structures that hold more fish at certain times than others. So what I'm going to go through today is how I break down ice fishing Big Stone Lake on a season by season basis basis during the ice fishing season. So I'm going to go through what I like to use, where I like to go, and how I break down Big Stone into a much more manageable lake so I can consistently come out here and catch fish throughout the ice fishing season. Have fish. Take a look at that pig. Oh, 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 oh. I think the best place to start with this is to give you a rundown of the basic layout of the lake. And Big Stone is a pretty simple body of water overall, but I would say the way I break Big Stone down is into three main sections. You have the north end, you have the middle section, and you have the south end. And they own, they, all three of them have kind of their own nuances. What I would say is we'll start from the top with the north end of Big Stone Lake. The north end is going to be the shallowest, the dirtiest, and the most void of any real structure. The north end, I would say, has some schools of perch in it, especially towards the southern end of the north end. But overall, it really doesn't have a lot in the way of panfish. There is some opportunity, but not nearly as much as you're gonna find in the middle section in the south ends of the lake. So for the sake of breaking down Big Stone, I would kind of eliminate the north end of the lake. And what I consider to be the north end of the lake is that last straightaway that points to the north. And that extends quite a few miles. But for the most part, especially as you get farther north, it really turns into more walleye territory and much less perch and bluegill territory. Once you come back down a little further and get to the middle section, what I consider the middle section is the area that kind of runs sort of east to west on the lake. That section of the lake is going to be the deepest water, um, arguably the cleanest water, and it's definitely going to have the most pressure. There's a lot of roads that you're going to find out there in midwinter. There's going to be a ton of fish houses that you're going to find out there midwinter. And that is for good reason. And that's because it has a ton of perch and a ton of bluegills. The middle section of the lake is an excellent starting point on Big Stone. It's arguably the most consistent fishing in the lake. 
The middle section is much clearer. It's much deeper than I would say the north end is. And I would say it might even be slightly cleaner water than the south end of the lake and a little bit deeper overall. Lastly is the south end of the lake. And the south end of the lake has deeper water in it, especially more towards the upper end of the south end of the lake. Uh, it turns more into a uh, siltier, shallow water, especially when you get below the peninsula. But the south end of the lake has the most structure in it. That's where the islands are located. That's where a lot of really major bays and points are located. A lot of rock piles are in the south end of the lake. You're going to find a lot of panfish on the south end of the lake, but you're also going to find a lot of perch down there. For the sake of ice fishing Big Stone, if you're new to the lake and new to the body of the water, invest your time in the middle and the south ends of the lake. That's where most of the perch, that's where the most of the panfish are going to be. Now that you have a basic layout of the three main sections of Big Stone Lake, the north end, the middle section, the south end, now we can start talking about structures within those sections. And they're largely the same, but it just seems like certain areas of the lake have more structure than others. So when thinking of, when talking about structure on Big Stone Lake in ice fishing, there's really three structures that stick out to me. Three that I primarily think about when ice fishing. The first of which will start up shallow is going to be the shallow structures. And that's generally anywhere from about three to five or six feet of water. You'll find a lot of rock piles up there. You'll find a lot of mud flats, especially in the bays, but you'll also find some sandbars up there as well. And that's generally what you're going to find for shallow structures. The perch can use any one of those three, but one I'll kind of get to later on in the video that really stands out, especially as you get to late season. The next structure that really congregates a lot of fish is going to be the main break on the lake. And the main break, you can find that from the north end to the south end, it extends up the shorelines. And that main break goes from the shallows, which are in that three to five foot of water, the break is like six foot of water down to about 11. That's going to be the main body of the main break. And where the main break kind of tapers out, a lot of times those are gonna be areas of siltier bottom. Those aren't as attractive to me, but where you find the main break really tighten up, those are gonna be areas around sandbars a lot of times, or more typically you're gonna find that around rock. And that's something I'm gonna be talking about real shortly here is main break on rock. And that's something that I definitely look towards earlier in the season. Lastly is the basin, and the basin is arguably what everything revolves around in ice fishing on many lakes, but definitely on Big Stone. Big Stone is a shallow, fertile body of water. It's got a lot of bug life. Fish grow really quickly out here and they get to really big size, especially the bluegills. And the basin, you know, can take credit for a lot of that. It's just a very shallow, fertile basin. It's about 12 to 14 feet deep, and it runs from the north end to the south end. It's like a big gut going down the middle of the lake. But fish are always relating to that basin throughout the entire year, but definitely in the winter, a lot will revolve around the basin, especially as you get into midwinter. So now we know the main structures of the lake. Now we know the main sections of the lake. Now we can start breaking it down into seasons. There's three main seasons that I think of when ice fishing Big Stone. You have early ice, you have midwinter, and you have late ice. And you can break it down a couple of different ways. One is by the calendar, but the more accurate way of breaking it down is based on conditions. So from a calendar perspective, early ice is going to be a December thing. Midwinter is going to be a January and February thing, and late ice is going to be a March, maybe even sometimes April thing. For the sake of breaking things down more accurately from a fish's perspective, early ice is what I consider when you're walking out and you're taking side-by-sides and four-wheelers and that sort of thing out, it goes up until about Christmas or the first of the year. It's before you get a lot of vehicle traffic out on the lake. It's when there's probably less than a foot of ice. That's what I consider to be early ice. Once you get to midwinter, midwinter is going to be when you have all the vehicle traffic out on the lake. That's when all the permanents are out on the lake. That's when all the trucks are driving back and forth. That's when all the roads are plowed. That's midwinter. 
Late Ice has about the mushiest definition out of the three. And that being is that Late Ice can vary a lot. What I would consider from a fish's perspective, the kickoff of Late Ice being is when you have that first real thaw, that big meltdown. And sometimes that could be as early as the third week of February. And sometimes that could be as late as the third week of March. But it's whenever you start seeing a lot more light penetration down below the ice, when things really brighten up down there, that's the beginning of laid ice. So now that we've gone over the seasons and the structures and the main sections of the lake, now we can start breaking things down into how I approach each season. So I'm going to go into each one of these seasons and I'm going to break it down into what my favorite technique is for that season as well as my favorite location. One thing that I would like to, a, a big caveat I'd like to point out right away before I get into this is that any one of the three main techniques that I'm going to go over can work at any time throughout the ice fishing season. Um, the little tungsten jig is the number one for both perch and bluegill, and it's something that you always need down the hole. That is the number one far and away best technique out here is just a small tungsten jig loaded up with bugs. The other two are great techniques as well. They can work at any time, but they tend to have seasons where they do better than others. The next is the areas in which I find the fish. When it comes to perch, perch are nomadic they can move up shallow, deep, and then back shallow again. Perch can be a little hard to predict at times as far as whether they're going to be shallow or deep, but there's definitely seasonal patterns to when they like to be out shallow or when they like to be next to the breaks and when they want to be out in the main basin itself. Bluegills are much, much more predictable. While the bluegills in Big Stone Lake hang out with the perch a lot, it seems like whenever they're in the basin, a lot of times they're together they tend to separate when you get to times of the year where the perch are moving shallow. The one thing that I don't seem to do well on on Big Stone is I, throughout, through the ice, I generally don't do as well catching bluegills in the shallows. I've had some incredible days perch fishing up shallow, but it just seems like the bluegills will typically stick out a little bit deeper. Not to say that they'll never go in shallow, but I would say overall as a pattern, bluegills tend to either be on the break or in the basin. I generally won't find them in shallow structures, whereas we get late into the season when things really warm up, the perch definitely will move up shallow on you. So with that caveat out of the way, we'll get started. And number one is early ice. And early ice, when I'm fishing perch and bluegills, the first areas that I'm going to focus most of my attention on is going to be the main break. Now, there's a lot of main breaks in the lake, and it can be really tough to know where to start. What I would recommend doing is finding where the main break is very distinct and where the main break has rock. So wherever I can find a nice break of rock in that 11 foot range, I don't like fishing the top edge of it so much. I want to be at the bottom edge. That's typically where I find them. And it's right in about that 11, 12 foot of water range. The first technique I'm going to do is use is just a small tungsten jig loaded up with bugs. Now there's a lot of sizes of tungsten jigs. There's a lot of colors. There's a lot of jigs out on the market anymore. What I do is I use three main sizes, three main colors, and I would say overall I really use one size and one color 90% of the time, and that's going to be a number five gold tungsten jig. And hear me out, the reason I like the number five gold tungsten jig is I can get it down fast and I can be extremely efficient with it. When the bite is good, efficiency is key to getting the most fish as quickly as possible. Perch are pretty aggressive at times, but they move very quickly. Having that big tungsten jig allows me to catch a fish, bring it up, take it off, and get it right back down and right onto the fish as quickly as possible. To go along with that, what I do is there's a lot of bug choices out there. You could use shrimp, you could use waxworms, you could use spikes. I always stick with the spikes. And the reason is the spikes are really tough. It's like they have a little bit of a skin to them and they have plenty of scent. The spikes allow me to put a whole bunch of spikes on there. A wise man once said, 
take your jig, load it up with spikes until they start falling off, and then put a few more on. And that's kind of the motto I go with most of the time. When it comes to spikes, there's a few different colors you can buy. You can get either whites or reds or the multicolors. To me, generally, it doesn't make too much of a difference. Maybe some days one color makes more of a difference than another. But the one time where I truly will pick one color over the other is when I'm using a camera and the water is kind of dirty. And the reason I say that is the camera is probably the most important tool you can have for ice fishing panfish, especially on big stone. It just, it makes a world of difference being able to adapt to the fish's moods and adapt your jigging cadence and just being able to figure out exactly what they want. When the water gets dirty, it gets really hard to see what's going on on a camera. And one little trick that I've found that's worked really well for myself to be able to see my jig better and help me use the camera for perch is by using the red spikes when the water gets either dark or dirty. And what I'll do is I'll set up the camera so the sunlight is backlighting my jig. I'll put on red spikes, they create a nice dark profile. That way I can see the dark profile of the jig wiggling even in dirty water or low light conditions. So bug color to me doesn't make a big difference except when I'm using a camera and the light is kind of low. The darker bugs, the red ones, definitely help me see things better. I load that big heavy tungsten jig up with a lot of spikes. I get it down fast and I catch the fish as quickly as I can. A lot of times that'll be the difference between having a pile of really nice perch or having a few mediocre ones is how quickly you can get back down to the school and keep them going. Sometimes you'll notice that you may catch one perch out of the school and then they move. But if you're a quick fisherman or you have a few fishermen around you and you're all quick, you can keep the interest of that school alive and you can keep those fish around you. And using that heavy tungsten jig allows you to be very quick, very efficient, and keep those fish interested in you and your area. Sometimes they just don't want that big gold tungsten jig. It's too much for them. You can never go wrong with a number four tungsten jig. It's small enough to get the job done when they're finicky. It's big enough to get back down there quick enough where you're still somewhat efficient. Number four gold tungsten jig will get a lot done for you out here. It'll work great. Lastly is the number three tungsten jig. And the number three tungsten jig sucks. It's no fun to fish with. The only time I pull it out is when the fishing sucks. And overall, I have special rods with two pound test line and little spring bobbers for fishing with these dainty little jigs. And you put like one or two maggots on there and you try to get one fish at a time when the bite's really tough. That's typically something that I'll pull out when you're dealing with a really high pressure. Perch don't do very well with super high pressures. They just, uh, there's something about them. I hear it's their air bladder. They go down to the bottom, they sit there, they don't feed very aggressively, they don't do much. If the bite's really tough or they've become really finicky for some reason, maybe due to pressure, that's when I pull out the number three gold tungsten jig, drop it down there with a bug or two on it and uh, grind some fish out throughout the day. That's a, a means of last resort. When it comes to jig colors, like I said, gold is my favorite. It's always a consistent producer. There's two other colors that I use a lot, and uh, one is going to be glow in the dark. Whenever you're dealing with a lot of snow on the lake, or maybe if it's getting lower light, sometimes you'll notice that, especially big bluegills, may bite later into the afternoon, into the evening, sometimes even at night. The perch kind of stop usually right when it gets dark, dark but sometimes the bluegills will extend. A lot of times that's when I like a glow in the dark jig. If you have crappies around, glow in the dark is an excellent color as well. The next color that I like to use is fire tiger. And it doesn't have to be fire tiger, it can be anything bright, bright orange, bright chartreuse, something like that. And that's just when I put it down there, maybe these fish at a certain point in the season have seen some offerings before. Fire Tiger is just different. It's just a, a different jig color to put down there. It's not something I use a ton of, but every once in a while I pull it out. Sometimes you'll get late in the season, you'll get um, into March and you'll have these big thaws on the lake and a lot of the streams will start dumping in real heavy into Big Stone and the water will start to get dark and dirty and churned up. That's another time when I switch to those bright jigs like Fire Tiger. One of the most common mistakes I see people make while pan fishing is 
simply overworking their baits. Uh, one of the best baits you can use for perch or big bluegills is just the small tungsten jig. And as the name implies with the jig, you would imagine that jigging it would be the way to catch fish. But what I've noticed is typically jigging, if like going up and down with the jig, is simply overworking it. And it's going to push fish away from you. Typically, the best way I've found to fish the tungsten jig is to simply quiver it and slowly lift it off of the bottom. When you look at the bugs that are in the lake, when you look at what those fish, what the perch and the bluegills are eating, they're just eating little macro invertebrates and they're just slowly wiggling around and barely moving up off of the bottom. So jigging very aggressively looks very unnatural to them. Once you start slowing your presentation down and just quivering your bait just above their nose and slowly lifting it off the bottom naturally like a bug, you're going to start catching a lot more fish. So set up on the main brake with a tungsten jig. Sometimes you may have to work your way up the brake, work your way down the brake, but the main brake right at early ice, a lot of times that's where my best fishing is going to be both on perch and big bluegills. Next is midwinter, and that is when everybody and their brother is out here. That's when you have all the little ice shanty towns and all the roads and all the hustle and bustle and commotion and generators and truck noise and just craziness going out on out on the lake. And midwinter provides some really great fishing. Don't get me wrong, midwinter can be excellent on Big Stone. A lot of people talk about a midwinter lull, and that definitely happens everywhere you go. But Big Stone still has some really great fishing and some incredible windows midwinter. What I generally do midwinter is I focus most of my attention in the basin. And it's just whether you're early ice, late ice, midwinter, the basin is going to be the most consistent producer of fish. The basin can be a little challenging to track fish down. More, it's because it's in your head, it's intimidating. What you'll see midwinter is you'll see these little shanty towns all over on Big Stone. Running from north to south, you'll see these little villages of fish houses. And it's just so alluring and attractive to just drive right up to those areas of fish houses and set right up in them or next to them and get in on the good fishing. A lot of times by the time there's a little village of fish houses, the fishing is over. Like that is done in that area. They're still catching some fish, definitely. But the main bite is in the past. So what I would recommend doing is if you want to get in on the best bite midwinter, you need to break away from the crowds. The real advantage to Big Stone in the basin in Part of the reason it's so intimidating is you don't know where to start as far as drilling holes and looking for fish in the basin because it's so big. But something you have going for you is just the sheer quantity of fish that are in this lake. There are a lot of fish in Big Stone. There's a lot of them scattered, but there's also a lot of massive schools. So there's a lot of ways to break away from the crowds and find your own school of fish out here. What I typically recommend is if you're in a truck and travel's easy, or if you're on a snowmobile or wheeler, drive a quarter mile at a time and pop a hole. You'd be surprised how many fish you'll, do, you'll find doing that, just totally off the beaten path, totally away from people. It may take you a while to find them, but when you find them, you'll have them all to yourself. And typically, even if you're the only guy around, a lot of times it's gonna be one of the best bites on the lake. So putting in your time, looking for your own school of fish, that's going to pay dividends, especially midwinter. Now, as far as techniques for midwinter, you know, the, the tungsten jig is still going to be number one midwinter, but something that I definitely incorporate midwinter is going to be a plain hook and minnow. A plain hook and minnow a lot of times will catch my biggest perch of the day. It's not so much a bluegill technique. The bluegills, you know, it, it's hard to beat a tungsten jig and bugs for those. But if you're looking for perch, that plain hook and minnow or a teardrop in a minnow, like a fathead, small shiner, crappie minnow, just a couple feet off the bottom or just a little bit over the tops of the weeds, that's where you're going to find a lot of times you catch your biggest fish of the day. Some days that's going to seem like that's all they want. They're just gonna want that minnow and hook. But a lot of days you'll find that most of your damage is done on the tungsten jig, but your bonus fish and your biggest fish are going to be on that plain hook and minnow. And lastly is going to be last ice. And last ice oftentimes produces the best action of the entire season. 
Uh, it can be a time of feast or famine, but most of the time it's feast. What I will say is some of the best days that I've ever had fishing are going to be late ice when I'm fishing in a sweatshirt, there's not a lot of wind, and you have these massive migrations of snow geese coming overhead all day. Those are some of my most memorable trips. I've had some of my best days on bluegills during those times. I've had uh, definitely my best days of perch fishing on those days. What I will say is there's definitely a big gap in where I can find those fish. When it comes to bluegills, generally I'm still going to find them deep. I may find them on the main break. I may find them in the basin at that time. The, the bluegills are generally going to be deep. I generally don't have my best luck on bluegills up shallow. I just don't. When it comes to perch, this is super hit or miss, but my favorite thing to do late ice is go up shallow. And that's three to five feet of water. I like to find a sandbar. I like to find something shallow. Could even be a mud flat at that time, but I really focus my attention on sandbars in that three to five foot of water range. Like I said, you want those days where it's warm, when you have the migrations of geese flying over your head and you're out there in a sweatshirt walking around with an auger punching holes. What I will say is when you go up into the shallows on those shallow sandbars, you can't simply just drill a hole and drop your jig down and expect the fish to still be there. Most of the time you gotta wait for them to come back. But what I like to do at this time is I like to go up, drill some holes over a larger area in those shallows, and then bring a big spoon with me, a big, gaudy slab spoon, rattle spoon. I like a quarter ounce chartreuse big rattle spoon, and I load it up with bugs, or I put a minnow head on it, and I jig it really aggressively about halfway down the water column. Now, if I'm in the basin, I do the same thing. I'll jig it about halfway down the water column. If I'm in the shallows, you know, you only have a couple feet below the ice. Either way, I jig that, I jig it aggressively. A lot of times you'll find that that bait will attract fish in. Another bait that you can substitute for it that works really well for this is a little rip and wrap or a rattle trap style bait. But I just like the big spoon because sometimes I nail them on the big spoon. I rarely get them to actually eat the rattle trap or rip and wrap, but the big spoon, a lot of days they'll go for it. And when you get late ice, if you're up in the shallows, most of the time when you're in shallow, you're gonna find those fish are big. They're all quality up there. But if you're out deeper, sometimes you run into these mountains of little mini perch that are just extremely aggressive and very annoying. And it's hard to sort through them because they just get to your jig before the quality fish can. When I go to that big spoon, I can sort those little ones out, man. They look at that spoon, they see it going all aggressive. They want nothing to do with it. They get close, they stare, but they won't touch. The big ones will get right through the little ones and they'll hammer it. And while some days, like I said, I have to switch back to the tungsten jig because the fish will get called into the spoon, especially up shallow, but they won't take it. There are other days where I just, I nail them on the spoon and that's all I need to use. For the spoon, all I'm using is a medium size walleye rod, just my walleye jigging spoon rod. Uh, that's all I need and it's, I'm just using walleye tackle and a lot of days, those will be my best days of fishing. That's when I get in my biggest perch, my fastest action. It's going to be up shallow with that big spoon on a sandbar when it's nice and beautiful out and you got the migrations of geese coming overhead. When I'm fishing the tungsten jigs, there's two main rods I use. I either use a spring bobber when I'm using the little three millimeter tungsten jig. If I'm going with the larger tungsten jig, such as the four or five millimeter tungsten jig, I'm just using a light action rod with a light tip on it. So those are the seasons, the structures, the locations, the techniques for catching perch and big bluegills on Big Stone Lake. Gonna give you a quick recap, a quick rundown, kind of a play-by-play -play of how I do things out here. First is early ice. That's why I'm really going to stick to those nice, sharp breaks. I'm going to fish at the bottom edge. I'm going to use tungsten jigs. A lot of times I can get in on some great perch and bluegills. Once I get to midwinter, I'm moving to the basin. I'm still using the tungsten jigs, but I'm definitely incorporating that plain hook and minnow. Lastly is when you get to late ice. Late ice is when I'm going to check out the shallows. It can be feast or famine when you go shallow, but when I get in on a good bite up shallow, it's definitely worth it. 
when I go up shallow, you know, a lot of times you're going to spook those fish away when you're drilling holes and moving around up there. But I really like to drill a lot of holes over a large area and then come back with the big gaudy rattle spoon and jig it aggressively to try to call those fish back to me. So I hope these tips help you out for your next trip to Big Stone. Thanks for watching and good luck fishing.